Thank you so much, Dr. McKeever, for the overview of the 10-year plan, um, your priorities and initiatives. Now it is my pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker, Dr. Malia Villegas. Dr. Villegas is an enrolled member of the native village of Afognak in Alaska, where she also serves on the tribal council. <clears throat> Dr. Villegas is a um, Alutik with family from Kodiak and Afognak Islands in Alaska and Oahu and uh, Lanai and Hawaii. Dr. Vileka serves as the Senior Vice President of Community Investments at Afognak Native Corporation, where she oversees strategic development, government and public relations, advocacy, marketing, and impact measurement. She also serves on various boards and committees, including the Data for Indigenous Justice Board. Dr. Villegas previously served as the Director of the National Congress of American Indians Policy Research Center. Welcome, Dr. Villegas. Chamai, good day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining this gathering. Thank you to the organizers. Chief Cook, it's been a long time since I've seen you, but I thank you so much for the introduction. I've got a few tough words in there, and, and you did that brilliantly. But I also <laughs> want to thank you for that legacy of leadership that you've inspired. Um, I've just uh, watched in awe in your uh, leadership, how you gather people together, and I just really appreciate your presence and your uh, prayer and words this morning um, were very meaningful, yeah. so Kayana to you. Uh, lastly, just want to thank my fellow speaker uh, who'll come on here in just a few moments, Dr. Brayboy. He's been a mentor um, for almost two decades. I did count. Uh, that means I'm getting old, not him. Uh, he looks the same as he did. So it's, uh, it's a joy to be back. I've, uh, it's been a long time since I presented to a national audience. Uh, so I appreciate your, uh, your willingness to visit with me this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be calling in from. Uh, the question that was posed to me was, what does health equity mean from a tribal perspective? So I'd like to share a few stories from my own experience working with tribes. Uh, as a tribal council member, I'm uh, beginning my eighth year of service to my own home community, um, as well as a native nerd, uh, data geek, uh, committed to trying to use data to identify better solutions. Uh, Ten years ago, when I started working with the National Congress of American Indians, there were a lot of discussions happening about data. It was 2011 uh, and Census 2010 had recently concluded. One of the ongoing challenges that we were facing at that time was related to invisibility. Um, at that time, it was really still difficult to be able to find native data in federal reports. Uh, the category of American Indian Alaska Native would often be listed but instead of data, you would see that little star or asterisk. I'd have to go to the bottom of the chart or the bottom of the page, uh, and you would see a little note that would say there you know, weren't enough Native people in the data set for the data to be significant. That was hard to read over and over again, and we really began to internalize that message that our people were not significant. Um, it happened so often that we coined the term asterisk nation. Um, even getting that high level of data, knowing that our tribal nations, you know, were invisible um, at the federal level uh, was the challenge. That the challenge was, how do we become visible? How do we become seen um, in the realm of, of health, of health equity, of federal data? Um, this, unfortunately, was not just a challenge with our federal uh, agencies and federal partners. It was a challenge with other communities of color. I'll never forget, I had to sit in for my boss. I was invited to a meeting of uh, what's called the Kellogg Foundation Anchors Group. It's a group of national minority serving organizations like the NAACP, uh, La Raza, Asian American Justice Center, uh, National Congress of American Indians. And we were gathered um, to talk about census um, and what we were going to be doing with the data. And uh, we were uh, getting settled and a gentleman from the NAACP stood up to welcome. They were the host organization that uh, for that meeting. And he started to talk about a um, study and a research a media report. Um, some of you have seen this kind of very scenario captured in a comic strip 
but I was living it. Um, he started talking about how for the first time in American history, children of color uh, were uh, being born at higher rates than white children. And he was just saying, what a historic moment for the first time in American history, for the first time. And towards the end, um, I just at the very end of the table, um, spoke up respectfully and just said, second time. And he turned his head, kind of puzzled, looking at me. Uh, and somehow maybe just, uh, you know, how I appear, he put two and two together. And he said, thank you, sister, welcome. Um, and we had a really hard conversation about erasure. Carrie, you talked about that in your opening comments um, and the idea that uh, we had to continue to fight to be at the table, to be seen, to be heard, um, and, to, and to really claim that space. Um, so that was really um, a lot of the work at that point in time um, was becoming visible. The more we were at the table, the more we were um, uh, claiming uh, that space, we began to hear, well, you know, the quality of the data that comes in from American and Alaska Native communities, tribal nations, it's just, it's not a quality that we can use. And the quantity certainly is not one that we can um, safely put into these federal reports. Your work needs to become improving the quality of that data. Um, so we started doing that, talking about, you know, building tribal data capacity, uh, building tribal data systems, um, improving the quality and quantity so that we could participate. And this is a term you'll hear in other international contexts as well about participation. Um, but the more that we did that, we increasingly found that the measures and the indicators were not meaningful. We could get to significance, right? As it's measured in a scientific context, we could get our numbers up, but the measures didn't necessarily tell us what we needed to know as tribal stewards, as community members about what was going on with our people. So we had to shift a bit to lo start looking at coming up with measures that did fit. Uh, one example um, that I'll never forget, we were engaging with an organization that produces the Kids Count it's an annual report on how uh, children in the United States are doing. They put a report out every year and they asked us to review at the NCI Policy Research Center, um, the American Indian Alaska Native section, and to provide suggestions about how to improve it. And what we did, we ended up writing a, a whole new section that didn't really ever get uh, adopted, but it's something that I return to where we brought together data on health, along with data on education, data on uh, justice, juvenile justice in particular, and data on what we called family economic capability. Instead of talking about poverty, instead of looking at um, lack of wealth, we started looking at what families actually had, what were the strengths. We didn't invent new indicators, we pulled them together in different ways and created state um, snapshots of how each state, like the Washington state, Oregon, Oklahoma, South Dakota, what could we learn about how these different uh, divisions and arenas um, were serving our children and our families. Um, it really was about shifting the gaze to the system, not looking at how our children needed to keep pace with their white or East Asian peers, but how we could enable and, and support our families, whether they were in the health context, education context, dealing with the justice system, um, or looking at how to understand family economies. And so we were really proud of that work to really take existing data, but to, to push on the measures and to help us understand uh, more and, and, and better what was going on um, for our communities. The more that we did that, the challenges came around comparability. We were finding fit, we were finding meaning, but it became us being set apart as different and unique, which we are. Differences, uh, diversity is excellence in, in my mind. Um, and yet the ability to compare, to aggregate, which is what you do in a lot of this work in, in equity context uh, was diminished. Um, and so we weren't invisible and yet we were still set apart, um, often disincluded, often forgotten, set aside, left to manage our own um, efforts. And it was hard to make that connection and to build those relationships around data and improvement. And it also came at, at the, the challenge of 
continuing to increase, increase our capacity uh, at the tribal level, our leadership around data, data use, as well as significant costs to manage. A lot of times there was a one-way um, approach to uh, taking data, but not a willingness to invest back in in that two-way data flow. Um, so ultimately, there were you know two lessons that I, I learned from that journey uh, with data. There have been many journeys with data, but that in particular was that as, as a tribal leader, I had to really come to understand that there comes a point where you have to remember that the goal is not to get to a perfect level of data quality. You know, you can invest and invest and invest and get the most accurate data, but really trying to get to a point where you understand some key trends uh, or patterns in order to make informed decisions. So what is that sweet spot? What is that point at which you have data that you need to inform the patterns and understand what's happening for your people? Um, and second, that we need at least a dual prong strategy. We definitely need to be working to ensure public systems are addressing inequity. And it was great to hear from, uh, from CMS this morning. Um, but we also need to be fostering community-based health development. Those two things, it's not an either or, it's definitely a both and. Um, I've uh, been involved in the first and lately uh, been doing more on the, on the second piece. And so I really wanna focus my, uh, the rem remainder of my time, my comments on the second strategy of, of community-based solutions. What could that look like? What has that looked like? Um, as someone invested in tribal futures, I've tried to start thinking intentionally about the kinds of data and information I need to bring to my fellow community stewards to make good decisions. So I began with a question of really, what does a healthy indigenous community feel like? What is it like to live there? What does the day-to-day -day look like? And I started to think about some of the groups I would need to understand. I'm a data geek, so my mind goes to, you know, grouping and, um, and typical st statistics. But rather than looking at some of those standard measures, I thought, well, I need to understand what life feels like for our elders and youth. That's typically where we start in Alaska. We even have an annual conference called Elders and Youth. Um, and I thought, well, I also need to explore what's going on for our women. Um, but then I can't ignore some of the trends I see, particularly for our middle-aged Native men in my family, in my community. Um, it's, a, it's a high risk group that I'm concerned about. Um, and then I thought about trying to understand what life feels like for our people with disabilities. Uh, what those who identify as LGBTQ are experiencing in the health realm and in their daily lives. Um, what about our community leaders? Are we healthy? Do we lead in ways that ensure our organizations are healthy places? This is a place where I spend a lot of time thinking about lately how to uh, create uh, healthy places of work for our people. Um, and it got me thinking also about a conversation I had with an elder in Montana years ago during a training. Uh, he pulled me aside and handed me a manila envelope full of data and information. And he said that they were experiencing high rates of cancer in their community. And they knew it was to do with something harming the water. But they could not get their research partners from the university to talk with each other across academic disciplines. You'd get the health folks coming to talk about, you know, uh, people health, and then you get the environmentalist, um, and could not get them to talk across to look at that relationality. Um, so really, how could I fully understand our community's health without looking at the water, uh, the state of our lands, at our plant and animal relatives? I'm an island person, come from islands on both sides. Um, these ecologies are critical, uh, fundamental, um, and ultimately at the presence of, uh, presence and health of our ceremonies, um, our spiritual uh, walks and what that looks like. So, you know, it may feel like I'm just listing out categories and, and an endless list uh, from your communities that you know, the ways that you would think about what you would need to know, what groups and, and conditions you would wanna try to understand. But um, I'm someone who sees patterns and I love a, a long list because then I love to group it and see what I can come, come up with, what's the, the thread for me at least. And I realized that I could get a sense of some of the key patterns uh, that I needed to understand by honing in on two particular key questions right now. And the first one is, what are the greatest strengths and challenges for families in our community right now? And this is a significant question, may seem very simplistic, but in a lot of indigenous research uh, domains, 
you'll see an emphasis um, on not just looking at individual units of analysis, what's going on for people, uh, individual people, but a push to look at communities and collectives. But I often find that that missing piece in the middle uh, that connects both are our families. And this is messy work. This is complex work because no one family really looks the same. And yet me as a tribal leader, I want to try to understand what is going on, um, what are those challenges, but really also what are the strengths that our families have that often get obscured in these conversations. We're a lot more adept sometimes at focusing in on what's not working than really seeing um, the, the strengths that we can leverage uh, together. So, you know, what is the living situation of elders in my in my community or your community? Um, are they living alone? Are they living together with other elders? Uh, are families living multi-generationally? We make a lot of assumptions, I think, about that, but what does it really look like if we mapped what was going on for our families in our particular um, communities, tribes and cities, counties? Um, if they are living multi-generationally, -gener is it by choice? Is that an intentional effort or are there particular um, needs and opportunities they are choosing to access by um, living uh, multi-generationally? Are grandparents increasingly raising grandchildren? This was something we saw in the Kids Count data. A lot of times the grandparents, and that's a strength, but if those grandparents don't have legal custody of their grandchildren, they often can't access uh, federal programs, state programs, county programs. And so the family economic capability, the ability for those grandparents to serve as head of household is very challenged. How do we address that? How do we look at that um, and, and help our families address that challenge? How many children are in foster care in our community? What supports are in place for mothers and new babies? Um, are there enough homes for families in your community? Is there enough child care? This is a linchpin that's affecting our entire nation right now. The, the, the dearth of child care options means that one or both parents cannot work full time, leading to a severe staffing shortage that I, I'm sure many of your organizations are seeing. This is a critical piece that we need to understand in the health equity conversation. Um, do families have enough access to healthy food? What is that emergency and preventative health treatment? And what does uh, financial planning look like for your family? So beginning to think at that family unit that touches those other groups of elders, youth, men, women, uh, LGBTQ communities, people with disabilities, and understanding families as a site of strength, but also a, a space where we can provide additional support um, to get to that goal of health equity. The second question really was, in our community, communities, are people generally joyful or in pain? Well, the last couple of days preparing this talk, I've talked to a few folks in my, um, my own household, my own community, and just posed this question um, and without hesitation over and over again. People are in pain is what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing. Um, is isolation and loneliness increasing or decreasing? Do people generally feel safe? Who's the most vulnerable group? Who's the healthiest? Um, are your community members hopeful about the future? What motivates and inspires them? As a tribal leader, you know, we often don't get to talk about con conversations about love and joy. And others of you may have heard me give talks years ago about love, love more. It's something that's important uh, to me, but I really do want to infuse this conversation about he health equity with some discussions about joy. And so as I get to the end of my time, just want to say a bit more about how we might get to that uh, notion of joy um, in the pursuit of health equity. Um, I believe that joy comes through a trajectory that many tribes are on, but it does require us to be aware of that trajectory and push forward. And in some places, that trajectory starts with safety. In my limited experience, I've found that many tribal communities are focused on health as safety, which could look like trying to prevent interpersonal violence, prioritizing food security, and or identifying the causes of accidental harm and death. One of the telling examples I remember learning about was a photo voice study with Native youth that asked those youth to take pictures of healthy food. The research team was intrigued by the number of pictures of hot Cheetos that came in. So they asked one young woman to talk about the picture she took, which included a convenience store hot dog and a bag of hot Cheetos. They asked her why she felt these foods were healthy. She explained that these were healthy foods because she got them at the convenience store, which is safe, 
warm, and well-lit. The food was not necessarily healthy because of its nutritional value, but because it was purchased in a safe place for her. Health for many of our people equals safety. In the field of education, there's actually a theory called safety zone theory, where scholars describe how our indigenous cultures have been deemed safe and dangerous at different moments in our US nation's history. So there's an important genealogy of safety that informs our present context. This is all to say that to craft a definition of tribal health equity, we must be willing to embrace relational health matters or measures like safety. It is not, for example, enough to imagine a whole community of individuals who have attained perfect health in their bodies if they do not feel safe in their world. Other tribal nations exemplify health equity as generosity. In many of our cultures, the wealth and strength of our leaders was measured not by what one one could accumulate, but by what one could give away to take care of the most vulnerable. When I look at the Alaska Native Medical Center or South Central Foundation in Alaska, or at the new hospital the Cherokee Nation is building, I stand in awe, so proud and inspired that our facilities not only aim to meet our community's unique needs, but are often awarded designations demonstrating the highest level of quality, expertise, and innovation. These institutions were also designed to benefit the communities they serve broadly. They are generous institutions in how they are structured to meet the needs of families facing health challenges and to uplift health for a whole region. Further, as tribal nations expand their farms and hydroponics to address food security, many are prioritizing the gifting of surplus to schools and elder care facilities. So while generosity as a concept is different from self-care or even prevention, it does allow health systems to foster both of those activities in a good way. I'll never forget the two questions I was asked as a patient for the first time at the Alaska Native Medical Center. Do you have any cultural or religious beliefs you would like your health care provider to know about? And how do you learn best? Reading a brochure, watching a video, or hearing information from another person. It was one of the first times I felt a sense of dignity and genuine kindness in a healthcare facility. Healthcare, health equity in some of our tribal contexts looks like generosity. Taking care of others is an important part of our own health. And yet, despite creating institutions based on our values, too many of our peoples and families are facing extreme pain. The national mental health crisis is evidence that medical solutions are only a part of the strategy we need. I do not have a lot of notes on joy to share because I find those moments are rare, but I believe it exists and I want to put it out there into the into the ether and it hinges around having healthy families. Those are the images I think of when I envision a joyful community, being surrounded by my family who themselves are healthy, preparing to share food, talking story and laughing into the night. It is a possible future for us all because there are few greater things than the sound of Native people's joy. We are hilarious <laughs> and we love to make each other laugh and rarely at each other's expense, but belly shaken, throw your head back, roll on the floor. Not sure always why I started, but I can't stop because you're still cracking up kind of laughter. We have deep capacity for joy and we deserve to be joyful. I thank you for this time and I look forward to talking story and making joy with you all. Kwayana Shinak. Thank you so much for your thoughtful words. And as always, you described perfectly the breadth and the depth of um, our concerns for our families as tribal leaders and service providers. And um, I, I just wanted to say it's it's fabulous seeing you again as well. I'm so happy that you're still in the arena. <laughs> um, if anyone in the audience has questions for Malia, please save them uh, for the question and answer session following our next speaker. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy. Uh, he's he's Lumby and comes to us from Arizona State University, where he is President's Professor, Senior Advisor to the President and Vice President of Social Advancement. He is a Fellow of the American Educational Research Association 
and member of the National Academy of Education. Welcome, Dr. Brayboy. Thank you, Chief Cook. I, I share Dr. Villegas' admiration of your amazing advocacy and work, Koyana. Uh, good afternoon, um, good morning. Uh, next slide, please. My name is Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy, and I'm the son of Mary Elizabeth Jones Brayboy. She was the daughter of Rose Bell McMillan Jones and Zelma Sampson Jones. She was also the daughter of McKinley Jones Sr. I'm also the son of Bobby Dean Brayboy. He is the son of Eva Harris Brayboy and Tecumseh Bryan Brayboy II. I'm a member of the Lumbee tribe and come from a small community called Prospect. Next slide, please. I'm also the father of Quanah McKinley Warner Brayboy and Ely Tecumseh Warner Brayboy. They're both Lumbee men. Uh, they're soccer players, one at Yale, the others off to Brown. They're both interested in computer science. Quana, the older boy, spends some of his time reading and thinking about finance and economic development in tribal communities. He likes to play poker. Ely, the younger son, spends most of his time chasing fun, usually catching it. He's an avid online chess player. They're handsome men. Thank goodness they look like their mother. Next slide, please. Our family currently lives in Phoenix, Arizona, which is where I am now, on the traditional homelands of the Akamal Otham and Peeposh peoples. Next slide, please. I want to offer just a few disclaimers before I, I move ahead. First, I'm an anthropologist. Um, I realize I probably shouldn't always be bragging about that. Um, who is primarily interested in two things, how to connect the wisdoms of indigenous peoples in institutions of higher education to make them places where students graduate from them healthy and whole. And I am interested in leadership as a process, a verb, a belief that leadership is fundamentally about creating um, the conditions for others to be successful. I'm not a healthcare expert. Second, I've been told by many others that patience is one of my strengths. I am, however, becoming less patient as I watch the structures I live and work in do a poorer and poorer job of helping society succeed. Forgive my focus on culture and my lack of patience. I'm going to, in my time, um, address the role of race and health equity in four acts. That was the first act. Next slide, please. Uh, in May 2020, through the end of that year, the Navajo Nation became one of the epicenters of the devastation of COVID as it raged from community to community, leaving them shattered. According to the CDC at the time, the infection rates for American Indian Alaska Native communities was three and a half times higher than the general population of the United States. According to the CDC, it now sits at 1.6 times higher. A recently published study in Mississippi using 2020 data of over 100 hospitals and 18,000 adults showed that American Indians um, were 30% of those who were hospitalized died compared to an overall 14% mortality rate. This, the study argued, in spite of the fact that American Indians had, and I quote here, lower average risk of death tied to comorbidities underlying conditions such as diabetes, liver disease, and kidney failure compared with black and white patients, as well as lower average age than all but two of the groups examined." End quote. Miss amidst the ongoing devastation is who was lost as a disease spread from person to person and community to community. It was our elders, elders who safeguarded the stories, traditions, deep knowledge, and culture, language, are links to the past and conduits to our future. Lakota anthropologist Beatrice Medicine once wrote, when an elder dies, a library burns. Each death of an elder in our tribal communities was a library burning. They were also someone's parents, grandparents, auntie, sister, brother, uncle, mentor, guide. In the midst of this heartbreak, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis and the forests of Australia had been ablaze for months prior. There was a health pandemic, a racial one, another one rooted in climate crisis. Part of what I heard in the anguish of it all was, our system is broken. 
I found myself puzzled by this sentiment, but unable to fully articulate why. Five months later, I had some help. In a compelling editorial on Scientific American in July of 2020, Sonny Dooley, who's a Navajo storyteller, argued that COVID thrived among Navajos, and I quote here, because we have built the perfect human for it to invade, end quote. Many Navajo peoples, she had argued, had their traditional systems of life disrupted by the ravages of colonization. Peoples were displaced, knowledge systems aborted and changed. Food systems moved from the land to the back of semi-trailers laden with commodity foods rooted in white sugar, white flour, and lard. Waters were poisoned and schooling was indoctrination into a foreign system. Ms. Dooley makes the argument that the infrastructure of American, Indi of American life have been built in ways that they've been working precisely as they were intended. It is not, she argues, a structure that is failing. The structure is successful, doing exactly what it was built to do. She concludes the article with this. Next slide, please. It seems to me that COVID has revealed a lot of truths everywhere in the world. If we were ignorant of the truth, it is now revealed. If we were ignoring the truth, it is now revealed. The truth is the disparity of health, well-being, and human value. And now that the truth has been revealed, what are we going to do about it? Many of us are told that some peoples are participating in their own unhealthiness, that any comorbidities are faults of their own or of nature. We are told that we are somehow failing. We are told the system is failing. It isn't failing. It has worked because we have designed a perfect health and social mechanisms to create failure for certain peoples. Science and engineering have been used against certain peoples. They have not served us well. Having known for over 100 years how the structure functions, Dooley's question rings loudly for me. What are we going to do about it? Next slide. Act two. In the process of signing approximately 371 treaties, American Indians relinquished a billion acres of land for three fundamental promises, health, education, and welfare. By welfare, I mean the general welfare of native peoples. Essentially, there was a belief that we would practice pastoral lives having access to water, food, space, and other necessities to lead healthy whole lives. Education was an understanding that teachers would be provided to assist schooling processes of our children. Over 5,000 laws, policies, and executive orders have been passed, enacted, and written. The final part of these promises is linked to health, in which the federal government assured tribal nations and communities that we would have adequate health care to lead healthy whole lives. The treaties, the treaties signed agreements between equals, which the Supreme Court has agreed is the supreme law of the land, points to larger questions of legal and political sovereignty. And the treaties only expire if Congress or the tribes in them. Treaties are nation to nation agreements. Once the lands were ceded, one side of the agreement was fulfilled. If we look at the history, it is apparent that the other side of the agreements have not been honored. In the last two decades, only one racialized group has had minimal or negative gains in schooling and achievement around math and reading. That's us. Native people's health care amounts to 60% of what is spent on federal prisoners per capita and the protection of environmental and food conditions to create healthy whole lives has been absent. The federal government has suggested that, that there simply isn't room in their budget to honor these commitments. In the midst of the Cobell case, it became apparent that the federal government used tribal funds generated from water, timber, and fossil fuel resources on tribal lands, um, and that they were used to build interstate highways, assist New York City with financial struggles, and assist GM in avoiding pulling out of, of bankruptcy. The U.S. could save cities, build highways, and a scion of the auto industry, but not fulfill its commitments. What does it mean when sovereignty is not recognized or trust relationships and responsibilities are not fulfilled? What happens when colonization and racism collide? A number of years ago, I advanced a concept called tribal critical race theory. 
In it, I argue that rather than racism being endemic to society, as critical race theory argued, the experience of indigenous peoples might be better explored through a lens that suggests colonization is endemic to society. I did not mean then, and do not mean now, that these ideas are mutually exclusive. I want to point to the liminal nature of native peoples. We have both a legal political status as evident in sovereignty, but we are also members of racialized groups. Racism impacts our daily lives. Sonny Dooley points to the challenges associated with what happens when the federal government succeeds in creating systems that generate and breed the conditions for the perfect, perfect bodies to host killer viruses. Colonization allows healthcare work providers and larger society to frame indigenous peoples, tribal nations and communities as something else to erase our presence by ensuring that many members of society imagine us as either being peoples who once were or hidden on reservation lands without any real sense that we are still here and we are everywhere. It is racism, however, that drives schools and medical providers to fail in serving the needs of, of indigenous peoples. There's a callous lack of care to work to overturn the long-term impacts of colonization. It is racism that seeks to dehumanize us through the use of mascots and the use of other slurs to describe women, children, and babies. It is racism that buries the number of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Taken together, colonization and race, racism, creates the conditions where federal uh, health officials ignore the unique needs and histories of native peoples when considering what health equity is, should, or can be. The session that we're currently in is one step toward asserting, both asserting sovereignty and its concomitant trust relationships and responsibilities with the needs to have groups of people who have been racialized to weigh in on what constitutes health equity. Next slide, please. Intermission. A really brief commentary from me about the use of, of the word resilience. According to the American Psychological Association, resilient, and I'm quoting here, resilience is a process and outcome of successfully adapting to different difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands, end quote. It seems to me that Native peoples have taken up this term, resilience, as a source of pride. We are strong peoples who, in the faces of relentless disenfranchisement, remain. We might say, we are still here. And we are. For me, I want to encourage us to dig in deep here. Frankly, I've come to despise the term resilience because it locates the onus for finding ways to manage taken for granted inequities and the challenges associated with these inequities on individuals. Too often, we forsake deep engagements in the idea that we should disrupt the structures that have led to the constancy of trauma by arguing that we are resilient. To be resilient over and over again ignores the fact that structures are creating constant trauma. It elides the responsibility of structures and institutions and the individuals that create them in creating and maintaining that trauma. My call here is for us to think about how we might challenge the APA and the others, including ourselves, the ways that we've taken up the use of resilience with pride. Our survival means everything. To do so in the constant face of genocidal and colonizing forces is extraordinary. But what if we moved away from thinking about how individuals and communities react to what has been done and is still being done to us to refocus on breaking structures and starting anew. This is, um, as your team has already noted in other, other um, meetings, resilience through culture. I'm suggesting uh, that we should move uh, to move it further so that we can create the conditions for individuals and communities to be healthy, whole, and thriving. Next slide, please. Act four. As I've noted, I'm not a healthcare person. I'm not a health equity expert. I'm only an expert on my life and it is sometimes a mess. Frankly, I'm doing the best that I can. But I spend a lot of my time thinking about how do we create the conditions for equity for indigenous peoples? 
Equity for me is fundamentally about justice. So we might ask, what does a just system for health look like for indigenous peoples? How do we create the conditions for just systems to thrive? On March 21st, 2004, tens of thousands of people showed up in Philadelphia to watch the implosion of Veterans Stadium. It took 62 seconds for the stadium to implode. There was sadness and rejoicing. It took over two years and $754 million to rebuild the football version. It's now Lincoln National. And two years and many hundreds of millions of dollars to build Citizens Bank Park, which is where the Phillies play. Why, you might ask, am I bringing Philadelphia into this? I spent my graduate school years in Philadelphia attending games at Veterans Stadium. I have a fondness for the city and for its teams. My point, though, is that it's exciting to blow things up. It happens very quickly. Building something is a longer, more fraught process. I would argue that we need to have the courage to consider breaking our current health systems and the stamina, persistence, and commitment to build, build ones that create the conditions for health, wellness, and thriving. Returning to Sonny Dooley, the Navajo storyteller with whom I started, who laid out the facts that the government built through its policies and the implementation of these policies, rooted in particular knowledge is the perfect body to host COVID-19. The response of creating a vaccine to mitigate the damage of the disease is an amazing human achievement. I honor it. It does nothing, however, to change the perfect host body. Next slide, please. To do so will require a reassessment of what we know about colonial practices. This must be followed by an exploration of what we will do to impact the long-term realities of poor underserved communities. This doing, the action, is about a reformulation of knowledges and about the creation of new actions and policies that create the realities um, of peoples. It will require attention to fresh, clean waters, the enactment of food sovereignty systems, better overall health care, and schools that honor the brilliance of students who can grow up to become doctors that serve the communities where those perfect bodies reside. We must start by engaging in this serious consultation process. I do not mean what I have come to think of as a lowercase c consultation, where we talk to a few people and say, well, we've consulted. I mean a capital C consultation that honors tribal sovereignty and enacts a meaningful engagement of trust responsibilities. We must ask peoples, communities, and leaders what conditions need to be created for you and your families and communities to thrive. And we ha must have the willingness to hear the answers, unfettered by budgetary responses. I understand that budget will, be in, but will become an issue, but it cannot be a constraint from the outset. These initial conversations will, will also force us to ask, if the infrastructure we have built is working as constructed, will our values and commitments allow us to break that infrastructure and try again, and again, and again, if necessary? If we do this, to whom will we listen? Who will lead? How will we ensure that we do not simply recreate the same system under different guises? Can we see the ubiquity of brilliance tied to bodies and beliefs of native peoples that we can create structures? We must engage in an honest and thorough assessment of capacity in communities. This will include schools, teachers, buildings, and larger infrastructure issues. We must ask, have we created the conditions for our young people to thrive, to become healthcare workers and researchers? Can we help our colleges, schools, and universities see the brilliance of peoples so that they can build new structures to prepare our children to lead in healthcare? We must look to the future. In the midst of the worst COVID moments, there was an end of times perspective that was being floated around. Philosophers have called the idea of the last as eschatology. And eschatology comes from the Greek eschatos, meaning the last. It is the study of the last or the end of times, but it can also be viewed as the future. Health equity, and my, my friend Malia said this earlier, must focus on the future, on new beginnings. What are the conditions necessary to start anew? Will we have the patience and commitment to build new ways? Let us be 
like those workers who created stadiums in Philadelphia, like our ancestors who built communities around and in and through shared relationships and concomitant responsibilities that attend to them. Let us move away from treating and fixing people to building structures that create the ability to thrive generation after generation after generation and so on. Next slide, please. Can we have the courage to challenge the status quo, to be willing to say what we're doing now isn't good enough? Let us endeavor to see the ubiquity of brilliance and learning, to be guided by a belief in the abundance of possibilities and peoples, reject ideologies of scarcity, and move toward understanding the power that resides in us all. Let us commit to teaching us to unlock the power toward creating systems and structures that do not create the perfect bodies to host killer viruses, but to create healthy bodies and institutions that honor the past and move us toward a more equitable, just future. Oyana. Thank you, Dr. Brayboy, for describing the stark truth of how we struggle with our own visibility and the lack of accountability on the part of dominant cultures and um, systems. Uh, we next would like to have an open discussion to share different perspectives on what health equity means from a tribal perspective. We invite um, Dr. Balegas back to the stage alongside Dr. Brayboy. So this um, might be even more of a summary, Dr. Brayboy, but um, what what what's distinctive about a tribal perspective of health equity? And I know you've really um, dove deep on that and what's most important to keep in mind that might be different from other contexts where people talk about health equity. And I really um, loved what you said about resilience in the in the context of um, constant trauma, you know, feeling feeling that we've achieved something or that we accomplished something by simply surviving and how do we get to thriving? Thank you for your kind mm -hmm. words. I, I said to Malia in a text beforehand, I'll make some people mad if I go after resilience. So I'm, um, some of you all will send me emails, I'm sure later. But look, I, I think that, that when we think about this, Vine Delory and Clifford Lytle actually argued that it was 2 billion acres of land that receded. I, I think the number is probably closer to a billion acres of land. And, and in the midst of land back, in the midst of us really thinking seriously and, and, and thinking about whose lands we are on. It seems to me that a tribal health equity has to really think about what kinds of promises were, were created. When we think about sovereignty, sometimes people wanna to go to the constitution and sort of say, well, we're mentioned in, in the US, we're mentioned in the constitution three times. Um, and I actually find real resonance in, in some of what Taigi Alfred argued early on, that it wasn't the U.S. that gave tribes sovereignty. It was, it was tribes that gave the U.S. and Canada sovereignty. It was the early treaties with us that constituted their legitimacy as nations by recognizing us as nations. But in the midst of ceding those lands and those promises, I want to go back to trust relationships and responsibilities. What makes health equity different for tribal communities is fundamentally that this country is built on tribal lands, on Indian lands, some of which were ceded and many of which were not. And so if we're going to do this, we can't be constrained by um, sort of hiding behind these budgetary issues. I think that there's got to be a need that sort of says, how are we going to create the conditions for communities to be successful rather than individuals? If, if our communities are healthy and whole, then we're whole. It's not us being healthy and whole that makes the communities that way. It's the larger group. And so I think the equity piece of this really needs to be community and communal oriented. The US is rooted in a whole bunch of laws and understandings about the rights and roles of individuals. 
And so for me, what happens when we shift that? I think some of the policy work that um, Malia did when she was at NCAI and, and some of my conversations with her are really useful here, which is what happens when we move from the individual to the community? I mean, her focus on families is important here. That's a communal piece of it. Communities and families drive this rather than individuals. Thank you. Um, Malia, would you like to weigh in? Certainly. Uh, Dr. Bryan said it said it so well. I'll just um, add a few other comments just to say I think that focus on relationships and relational measures, however we can, there's this predominance to focus in on that individual level rather than looking at relationships or shining that light back on systems capability, which I think Dr. Brayboy also talked to. And I'm really glad that you mentioned the Constitution because in some of the work that we did at NCAI, we were really um, uh, encouraged to look, uh, we had a project around tribal public health law. And it uh, allowed us to enter into relationships with a range of tribal nations and explore their codes, tribal codes, to try to understand what tribal leaders had put in place over time um, and, and how the definitions of health, what that looked like. We found examples, you know, related to um, uh, women in California, tribal women um, weavers who would take the reeds from the water and strip them with their teeth and wanting to perpetuate this, uh, this tradition and teach it to their children and grandchildren. And yet the waters were contaminated. And so they, you could see in the tribal codes around water safety, around cultural development, how they were navigating the continuing of their practice through the use of other kinds of materials while the waters uh, were healed and, and taken care of. You had MMA fighting really emerging in the Southwest and a desire for people to be physically active in a sport that, you know, is deemed dangerous in a lot of ways. And tribal nations putting laws and codes together to look at how do you uphold physical activity and yet protect your people and balancing these notions of, of protect um, and safety in, in very important ways. And so really encouraging folks in looking at what's distinctive to really go to our own laws, our own codes our own ways um, that, that are, are in place right now. Um, uh, NIHB, NARF, other organizations have host some of these codes and you can go and look. And this is another piece uh, and, and I think what we do, which is we share knowledge, right? Hey, what are you guys doing over there? Hey, what can, can we, oh, that might work over here. Hey, let's, let's, let's take pieces of that. And I think that's distinctive in that we want to share and we want to build uh, collectively. It's not just about what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours, but figuring out how you know we can uh, raise uh, raise the tide for all of us going forward. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions from the audience. If um, anyone would like to speak, we ask that you use the raise hand feature, and um, you will have the opportunity to um, ask your question directly to our speakers, or you can put the question in the chat box. And I'm going to change. Are there any questions? Okay. Dr. Payment. Okay. You know, I don't like awkward silences. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I have to admit, I'm a little bit of a fanboy here uh, for both of our speakers. Um, I've watched both of your careers, and my career has been shaped by both of your careers. So uh, for that, I want to say thank you. Um, I do have a couple of uh, kind of detailed questions, um, one for uh, Dr. Villegas and one for Dr. Brayboy. Uh, but I do want to call your attention to a link that I dropped in the chat, it's a um, survey that we're conducting at NIHB to collect uh, sort of or impacts, tribal, tribal community impacts of government shutdowns, because we're really close on the cusp of getting its appropriations across the finish line, but uh, we're, we're being told by legislators that they still need to understand the impacts. Um, and we've been telling that story, but we just, we gotta keep telling that story. So please, um, everybody who sees those links, copy and paste it and encourage your tribal leaders to fill it out. So for Dr. Maligas, how can we, um, how can we help uh, advocate that federal agencies don't just relegate us um, to that asterisk nation. So how can we take what you shared with us 
And how do we impact decision makers so that they don't just keep ignoring us or or um, I really like the way that you packaged it in terms of invisibility, because we, we've always been considered the um, vanishing Indian or the, um, the invisible minority. And so that would be productive. And then Dr. Brayboy, um, your research in tribal critical race theory is kind of like the, the light bulb moment for me. <clears throat> As we look at data and we see the worst of the worst statistics and the broken promises report. And so some people might say, well, pull yourself up by this bootstraps, it's your own damn fault, or or there's something inherently or genetically, you know, inferior about us that we can't we can't break out. So um, what can we do to get a greater understanding of that? Because the, the work that you've done to me was really kind of like the threshold moment that explains why we have the perpetuation and the cyclical um, sort of oppression that holds us down. So each of those questions for you both. Thank you. I'll be quick. It's nice to see you, uh, Dr. Payment, um, after a long time. I'll just say that I do think um, we have to take a multi multiple pronged effort to continue to be at the table. And that means we need to grow uh, our leadership into those roles to continue to uh, push and to talk about the importance of being at the table. Um, because I don't believe that systems are capable at this point of representing for us without us. So I think that's a key piece. The other is I would really, uh, I really started to our organization look at state level data. Um, a lot of times federal uh, can seem so large and looking at more of a regional approach, which we do in my own home region a lot. We collaborate, we look at regional data when we don't have, you know, data enough at one tribal level. But looking at what states are doing, creating these state profiles can create a level of visibility that seems more more possible and doable that the federal uh, agencies might be able to adopt and understand in better ways. And uh, my teams will, will uh, um, you know, uh, expect me fully to talk about case studies. I really believe in developing more case studies of strength of what it looks like. A lot of our products, um, you know, before I left NCI, were really trying to emphasize short examples. Uh, the Canadians, uh, First Nations, use their policy documents to provide examples of what this policy could look like in actual practice. Um, and I think that we need to do more of that to help Im improve our visibility, but also to share across organizations about our strengths and what's working well, as well as efforts that might not have gone the way that we um, would have liked. So Honoring Nations is a great example, but I think we can do more to document case examples of what's working well and share that across to get through that invisibility barrier. I love that answer, Dr. Villegas. Um, you know, I have a lot to say about this, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it all. Thank you, Dr. Payment. I'm a, a, a big admirer and fan of yours. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of feel like that for me, part of what I've wanted to say in terms of building on this larger question of visibility and invisibility is that I wanna continue to hold up the ubiquity of indigenous brilliance. And I just don't know that we do that en enough and, and also the ubiquity of our presence. And, and while there aren't, um, in thinking about 340 million people or however many there are in the US to think about us as six or 7 million of that seems like a, um, for some a relatively small number, but our presence is huge. I live in Arizona. We are 6% of the population here, but tribal peoples and nations and communities control 34% of the water and 33% of the lands. And if you think about the future of the US, if you think about the future of the world um, and the future of this planet, it is going to reside in and around water and waterways. I mean, health starts in so many ways. I think Dr. Villegas's point earlier about the reeds revolves around water. And so we have an outsized role in in this, we have an outsized role in, in the founding of, of what is now the United States. And so I think my encouragement is for um, anyone that has policy making roles and abilities and powers is to understand one, that there's a whole bunch of brilliance in, in and around our communities and two, to educate themselves on, on, on the unique histories. And I'm not saying our histories are better or more important than anyone else's. I am saying that our histories are important and they've been erased um, in so many powerful ways as, as sort of part of this story is there are all of these myths about how the US came to be. And if you tell a myth 
over and over again, it becomes a truth. It is still a myth that has become a truth. And so for me, having folks understand where those histories are and, and, um, and then say what our, our commitments toward a future becomes really important. Thank you. Um, Andrea Medley. Well, um, hello uh, to both of you for what you shared so far. It's been um, really inspiring to hear and I'm grateful to be here today. Um, I have a question more towards um, Dr. Villegas. Um, sorry if I got your name wrong. Um, so I really liked um, what you had to say about incorporating joy into the work. And I'm just wondering if you could share a bit more about how you do that in, um, in this field where everything is so deficit focused and the way we access funds is deficit focused. We start off by saying this percent of, you know, indigenous people have this condition and it's always, you know, um, very, very negative and that it's, it's structured that way. And I definitely see changes toward that, but I'm wondering how you approach that in your work and if you have any further resources that you would suggest to check out. Certainly. Thank you so much for the question. And uh, I think that is the challenge. As I was as writing this, you know, I, I thought I'd tend more towards the love talks that I've given in the past, but joy just kept coming forward. And it might be because, you know, during the pandemic, I I, uh, I had a son and he is just um, he's two years old now and he is just the joy of my life. And so as I was, you know, writing this and thinking about what is the goal here? Where are we heading? I just couldn't get him and our family, you know, out of my mind in terms of thinking about what do I want to create for um, my own tribal members and what do I want for them and, and seeing how much they're carrying both because of the pandemic, but because of so many other things. And so I think it really does, you know, for me, it did start with really shifting that deficit um, orientation. And it doesn't mean, like I was saying, to go away from the measures. A lot of times that's a lot of the data that we do have, but packaging them in a different way. I think that grandchildren, uh, grandparents raising grandchildren was a, a really pivotal moment for me to think about that concept and the idea, you know, that this is what a lot of our families are looking like. We do a lot of work with uh, ICWIN and child welfare in, in my tribe and understanding and also, you know, my dissertation work that looked at uh, how to graduate 500 Maori PhDs in five years, why a community would invest and what I learned and, and how they did it was it was the mamas and the grandmas who were raising their their children. And it wasn't so much that they wanted to go on to become doctorates or professors uh, or PhDs or professors themselves. It was because they wanted to inspire their children and grandchildren to stay in school and to achieve. And so instead of having to wait 25 years for a change in educational outcomes in New Zealand, it was eight years. Uh, you had grandmas graduating in the same moment as granddaughters at the same ceremony, you know, college. And so the idea of looking at those relationships, focusing in different ways on family as a unit of analysis instead of shining a light on why aren't our kids performing? Why are our, our people so unhealthy? What is going on with our families? And really documenting those strengths. I, I can't emphasize the case studies enough. That's where my passion is. And really when I think about what work I wanna to continue to do, it's writing those stories, uh, supporting tribal uh, communities and, and rural communities in doing that because there is ubiquity of, of brilliance everywhere. We're just so conditioned to look at the negative and we're even trained to do that. So uh, those are small ways, but um, I'd love to talk more with you all about what this could look like and also tracing our policy genealogy. Whenever new policies get instituted, looking at where they come from because they don't just come out of, out of nowhere and understanding if those policies are really designed to uplift who we are and, and see our uniqueness or, or designed for other purposes, which I think is, is where Carrie started us out uh, this morning on looking at that colonization and those impacts. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Daniel Preston. Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm uh, Daniel Preston. I'm a Thon Autumn legislative representative from the Santa Verde District. And um, I just really, um, not so much as a question, but more of a thought. But however, I just wanna um, commend the uh, speakers um, really opened my mind and these are were some of the things that I've been thinking of, of, of 
parody, um, that first question when um, Ms. Fields opened it up was, um, you know, what, what is equity? So my thought, you know, I, I put parody in the comment section and my, my thought, and it, it has been for, for a couple of years, was that how are we going to get to the parody of, of once where, where, where we once were as the Native American, American Indian people? I don't think necessarily it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the non-tribal or non-Indian uh, parody where we always keep comparing that. But what uh, my thought right here is, what does that look like? And I think the conversation we're having is more thoughts of um, what what does that look like in the long run? What does that look like for a healthy American Indian person? And so I, I think um, the panel, you know, for for that that resilience and and thriving, you know, when I, I think when um, if we were to do some kind of a data gathering with young people and that Cheetos um, um, story was a very good example of it you know, thriving, what, what is the successful Native American health-wise, economically, what does that look like? So, you know, again, I just want to um, thank you for the conversation and um, just want to put that thought out there that, um, you know, that we, we uh, hopefully we start working toward that. What, what does that look like um, in, health, in health terms and uh, holistic terms, mental well-being, economically, social economics. So again, I that's my comment. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Lyndon Schuyler. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for for allowing me to be here. First of all, I, I'm I'm enjoying this enormously. And I have actually two questions, but um, and probably no time <laughs> for at least one of them. Um, I work for the Illinois Public Health Association. One of our goals this year has been to really bring in all of those populations into Illinois Public Health and into all health considerations that affect the people within Illinois. That includes. Uh, the American Indian, Native American populations. And I've had a very hard time making contact. Um, I know I've tried to make contact um, in the Rock Island area through through the chamber and through the university on the Cook County side. And I don't know if there's anyone here from, from Illinois who might be able to assist me with this, but we very much want to bring all perspectives into into the public health conversation and i am particularly wanting to do this i'm i keep hearing dr brayboy talk about erased uh, and i would love to be able to have a further conversation at some point my grandmother was one of those who was taken into a boarding school at a very young age and with her entire life erased, forced to marry one of her teachers. And while I know my history only through efforts of, of digging, of course, I have no quote unquote right to a tribal affiliation, or at least I've been told that too many times, which is very upsetting to me because I know in my heart who I am and what I am. And I know what drives me and I know what moves me. And I've never known how to, I, I guess I'll use the word recreate that, that which was erased. And I suspect I'm not the only one in this audience. I'm certainly not the only one in Illinois. I'm not the only one across the country. And um, anyway, those are those are both of, of my thoughts and concerns. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. We have um, six minutes, I think, left, and we have a 
hard stop at, at two o'clock. So we'll take um, Lorna Elliott Egan. Miigwech. Um, I am the tribal liaison for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And I wanna say uh, thank you so much for the powerful presentations that were made today. Um, and I kind of wanted to share some of the things we've run across here in Michigan where tribal data sovereignty and the quality of our data on Native Americans and tribal citizens has been something we've been trying to work on this year, um, especially in response to what we encountered during the COVID uh, pandemic. And so in the work that we've done, we've looked at our systems and discovered we have more than 300 separate individual data systems within our department that collect different pieces of data that don't even talk to each other. And so from our place, this is a huge challenge because there's no catalog of what is contained in those different systems. So to try to go to a tribe and say, what data can we give you if we don't even know what we have has been a challenge. So we've decided rather than try to tackle it all at one time, we're going to take bits and pieces where we know we have issues. And in some of the work that we have done related to um, a tribal reimbursement for our prescriptions, we have discovered that the tribal data, Native American data that we have in our system that reflects Medicaid data collection is flawed in that we have found that there are a number of especially older elders that apply for benefits from us, but don't identify themselves as Native American. So none of that data is being collected or reflected in our Medicaid data. And we're very frustrated trying to figure out how do we attack that in partnership with the tribes. We have come up with a system we're going to try to um, put in place uh, for tribal health centers, but it still doesn't attack the problem of Native American individuals being afraid to identify themselves as such to a, a, a state government. And I don't know what we can do about that, but um, we're going to continue to work in partnership with our, our tribal health centers and with um, tribal governments here to try to figure this problem out and do a better job of providing data to them and trying to collect better data. Um, one of the challenges I constantly run into with our folks is we can't report this because HIPAA prevents us from identifying such a small cohort in this geographic area. And I don't know how we get around that legally, but we're working on it. Um, so that's, I just wanted to share those things. Um, and I wish everybody trying to work on this issue a lot of luck, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, thanks for that. I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Roberts if he, if he can put his question in the chat and our speakers can get back to you um, with that and uh, with a response. We have two minutes. I want to, um, just have one last question and you have a minute each. Um, <laughs> uh, what's, what is the one strength on a, on an upbeat note that we have as native people um, that gives you hope for the future of health equity in Indian country? All right, I'll jump in and just echo what you said earlier. Um, so many, but I think our awareness about the importance of lands and waters. And to me, that's about relationship and how, you know, when I went to New Zealand, um, I would come into different Modi communities and they would say, welcome, you're at the center of the universe. Welcome, you're at the center of the universe. And I walked away thinking how beautiful we have multiple centers of the universe. And yet we in, as humans are not in the center. We are one of a number of, of beings of life and we need to acknowledge that. And the fact that native people, I think have more of that awareness and bring that to the conversation is why we need to be at the table, not just for ourselves, but because the planning and building we do is inherently about how we can benefit all forms of life. And that is our way. Thank you, Dr. Brayboy. I love that. I want to echo it in, in lots of ways. I want to just, I want to take five seconds to say we are entitled to joy. And I want to just sort of forefront that. I really appreciate Malia's comments on that. 
I think we've got, you know, we have millennia of knowledge that is cumulative in terms of thinking about relationships to place. We are, we have such incredible knowledge about how to heal and how to engage in healing prospects and larger questions of relationality and responsibilities that, that really get to reciprocal understandings between peoples and place that isn't about centering human beings. And I think when I say that brilliance is, is ubiquitous, there's lots of forms of brilliance, but one of them is having these knowledges is about connectedness to land and health that I think are worth really exploring and going going toward. Thank you very much. I want to thank both of you um, for joining us today and providing your uh, your light and your insight and um, your perspectives. It was really um, it was really inspiring today to um, listen to both of you and uh, hear, your, hear your thoughts. So I, I have to turn it over to Carrie because we could just go on and on. <laughs> but uh, 